So we were just talking about, you know, potatoes and the pests and potatoes. And one of these that we alluded to a couple of times was the Colorado potato beetle. And of course, we're looking at different stages of the Colorado potato beetle. As you mentioned, Claudio, this is, is, is sort of a, um, you could say it's, it is indigenous to North America. It's mostly indigenous to Latin America. And then of course it made its way across uh, North America as potato was introduced. So it's, it is sort of a, a new arrival, I would say in the last 150 years across much of the potato growing area. But it's a, as we've talked about, it's a specialist on potato. It overwinters right in the areas around potato. They overwinter as adults. They overwinter in the soil. They go down about 24 inches, 30 inches sometimes. And then as adults, and then they overwinter and they reemerge re in the spring. And in Wisconsin, we have around two generations per year. So we'll have overwintering adults that will emerge. They will mate and lay eggs and they feed just a little bit. But once they've laid their eggs, then that generation of adults dies. Then we have those eggs that hatch into larvae and those larvae continue to feed. They will go into a pupal stage in the ground around the 4th of July, give or take, depending upon where you are in the state of Wisconsin. And then they'll reemerge again. And that's what we're looking at here. So today is, I think, the 28th of July. And we're looking at now the reemergence of adults. So we would call this, these adults, the first full generation. Well, these will now mate, lay eggs, and those eggs will hatch and they will give rise to these larvae that you can see here. And there's a variety of different stages of, of larval development here. Most of what I see, I would say, are middle-aged larvae, second or third instar larvae. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're gonna to continue to feed. They're going to pupate, and then they're gonna go into the ground as adults. Well, that's what's interesting is what's happening right now in Wisconsin. Those adults will, the majority of those adults will just stay in the ground and overwinter. But probably 30 to 40% of those will pop right back up again in September. And so in the now 15 years that I've been here, we are increasingly seeing more success of, of a third full generation being able to uh, develop and establish on this crop. So is this a, a sign of things to come? Is this a, a, a mark of climate change starting to affect the, the, the plant, plant pest, pest interactions? interactions? It, <laughs> uh, we think it is. <laughs> um, we see in different parts of, of the country uh, still, you know, a single generation per year. In northern Wisconsin, where we grow seed potatoes, uh, still, there's really only about one or one and a half, I know it's hard to say that, one and a half generations, but there's still only about one full generation that can affect the potato crop in an economic way. Um, and I would have said in central Wisconsin, there, were, there really were only two, but we are increasingly seeing um, this phenomenon where this third generation is having more success. I don't know that we'll have a lot of success in showing you the, the other insect that is, is, is probably the most damaging out here. You might think, oh my goodness, there's an insect that's more damaging than these that we've just looked at. But you can see on these leaves, you can see on these leaves, they haven't really been chewed um, to any ex great extent, but these leaves are curled up these leaves are rolled up. This is the result of hopper burn. So the leaves will roll in response to feeding by an insect called the potato leaf hopper. It's a small uh, cicadelid leaf hopper that feeds in the vascular system of the plant. When it feeds, it injects saliva. The plant reacts to it as a toxin, and it actually causes the phloem or the sugar conducting elements to um, uh, become non-functional. And when sugar becomes non-functional, uh, excuse me, when the, when the sugar conducting elements become non-functional, the roots start to suffer. And when the roots start to suffer, then the water um, movement starts to suffer in the plant. And this is what you're seeing is water stress. So this leaf rolling is effectively a water stress. Here are some of the very young 
um, leaf hoppers, these brilliant green right at the end of my finger. That's probably a second instar nymph, and there's a first instar nymph right in the middle of that leaf. They are very tiny. Um, but yeah, that's a cast skin. That's a molted cast skin. Yep. But it really is the condition that you're seeing in this potato crop, the, the chlorotic canopy, the rolled leaves, and just the general um, sort of unfavorable um, uh, condition, if you will, that the, that the canopy is in is largely due to the damage of potato leaf hopper. Yeah, so we're standing in here in the cabbage plot and as we were approaching, you were seeing some of the adult um, cabbage white butterflies. This is the imported cabbage worm. What you can see here in the cabbage, just across all of these plants, are just this shot hole feeding, just holes that are, you know, throughout the canopy. And in large part, that's due to the, the larvae of the, of the cabbage white butterfly. It is an imported pest uh, that has been in the U.S. now for quite some time. But there are really about three different uh, uh, caterpillar pests of cabbage that we recognize as being most critical. And they include the diamondback moth and the imported cabbage worm, as we just described, and then also cabbage looper. They, they to some extent, have a little bit of different phenology. The imported cabbage worm is one that overwinters here in Wisconsin and gets established in the crop pretty early. And because it's here and here early, um, and because it's a large caterpillar, it can do a lot of damage very quickly. And again, just a reminder, the imported cabbage worm is the adult butterfly that we're seeing here. That's laying eggs all over this crop that are hatching into caterpillars, hatching into larvae, that are doing the lion's share of this, um, of this shot hole type of feeding. Yep, that's pupa of imported. Right, that's imported cabbage worm pupa, very lime green, angular uh, looking pupa, very much alive. And of course, it would emerge as an adult shortly after that. Yep. These white butterflies that we're seeing, this is the pupal stage yep. of that. Yeah, that's, that's great. great. Yep. Uh, of diamondback moth. So it's a little bit wet, but that's the pupa of, of diamondback. So the, the diamondback moth is a relatively small moth. It's only about, at maybe at most, a, a quarter to a half an inch long. And these are the larvae. So here's probably a second instar larvae. This is maybe a third or fourth instar larvae here. One way to diagnostically tell if it's diamondback moth is actually to touch it. And I don't know if he'll behave, or they will behave the way I expect, but if you touch them, they will really wriggle. Oh, there it went, right? And we'll see if this one will do it. Eh, less so. But uh, this one did it for us. We'll see if, yeah, there it goes again. But those are diamondback moths, uh, the larvae. And they, they feed in a way they call skeletonizing. Yeah, and Claudio's got one. Absolutely. As we were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, the aphids that transmit these are not necessarily aphids that want to live in pepper. They can, be, um, they can be aphids that are moving out of one crop, trying to find yet another crop. So and they're making a mistake almost. They effectively are. And their vision is not that great. And so the way that they know that they're in a crop that they want to be in is by probing or taking a taste test. And because many of these viruses that they transmit are held right on the stylet tips, once they make a probe, um, to try and test where they are. If they are viruliferous, which is a term meaning carrying or payloaded with a virus, once they probe, they can easily transmit. So as you can see, we're seeing, we're seeing this symptom. It could be alfalfa mosaic virus. That's a condition that we call calico. There's some really pretty symptoms, in fact, you know, on, on some of these leaves that, you know, if you want to look at um, they're, um, those are, those are kind of indicative of, of AMV or alfalfa mosaic, 
but it's just this one plant that's right out here all by itself and this is pretty typical because that aphid that moved in here might have landed here taken a probe in many cases when they feed and probe like that they'll clean their mouth parts most of the virus particles will maybe be ingested into this one plant and then when the aphid goes to the next plant and the next plant there may be no virus to transmit anymore so to see a virus infected plant like this as a loner right out in the middle of the field is certainly not uh, surprising. Now a little bit of the challenge here is, is if you have some initial or early establishment of virus in a crop and you have successive waves of aphids that maybe move through that crop, then it can be subsequently picked up and moved from like that plant to an adjacent plant to an adjacent plant. And we call that secondary spread, meaning once it's gotten established in the crop and if there are aphids that are still present or prevalent, then those colonizing species, their presence just alone may not be doing anything, but um, as far as being at an economic level, but they can, they can rapidly move viruses around.